He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Those are the voices of our, some of our staff members reciting our memory passage, and I've been playing that over and over again, enjoying the scripture, the power of the scripture, but also hearing the voices of our staff mates as well. So let me just say to Sarah and to Hannah, thank you for that beautiful piece. I know how hard you work to be excellent. You, you blessed us and honored God with your gifts, so thank you for that. Let's, let's bow and ask God to speak to us through his word. Lord Jesus, you've told us that the word of God, your word, is living and active, and it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It's able to pierce our thoughts and intentions, even dividing our soul. So we ask you to do that and speak to us. Amen. Some of you have remarked that uh, there's less of me these days. It's true. Uh, I'm not sick or anything, just trying to stay healthy. Uh, But I've had to buy a bunch of new clothes. And my wife uh, has commented that I just basically replaced all my old clothes with smaller versions of the same clothes. I buy blue and gray and, and shirts, and she's like, you just buy the same thing. I'm like, yeah, well, you know. I have a utilitarian kind of a relationship with clothing. I want it to be comfortable and, you know, functional and, 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 that, and so on. Some of us are different, right? We have different kinds of relationship with clothing, don't we? Some of you are much more about style than you are comfort. And uh, some of us are more about function. Does it work, you know? I buy the same thing over and over again because, uh, because I like it and, it and it fits and it's comfortable. Well, I noticed when my kids were younger, they had a different kind of relationship with their clothing. They didn't, my, my daughter would put on her princess dress. It, she didn't just wear a princess dress. She became a princess. She inhabited the clothing and became what she was wearing. My son would put on his army pants and he became a soldier. You know, he didn't just wear fatigues, he became a soldier, or a pirate, or whatever they were wearing, you know. Or Superman pajamas, they were Superman. You see an image here of my kids. This is not Halloween, this is just bedtime. So no, <laughs> Noah is now 23, Ben is now 19, and Hannah's 21. So that's a long time ago, but you know, that's, they're, they're becoming those things when they wear those clothing. Um, it's transformational. Something happens to them when they change clothes. Like when Superman, when his alter ego is Clark Kent, but his identity is Superman. And when he removes his Clark Kent suit, you know, he becomes his true identity. That, that idea is at the heart of what Paul's writing to us here in Colossians in chapter 3. This idea is, is, is really important for us to understand about identity. What it means to put off and put on, and he uses the imagery of clothing. Uh, our series is called All Things, and you know where we got that title from. You heard it read a moment ago by Terry and by the, in the video. All things hold together in Christ. And Paul is writing to this church in Colossae in modern-day Turkey that's a kind of out-of-the-way town, a, a small group, a, a relatively young church who he's never visited, but he's heard about their faith, and he writes to encourage them. And what he says in the first two chapters is, focus on Jesus. Everything hinges on who he is. Stay laser-focused on Jesus. And now in chapter 3, he's going to swing a bit and move to talk about Okay, if Christ is the preeminent one, the all-sufficient one, if he's all that we say he is, then how, how, what difference should that make in your life? How should the fact that all things hold together in Jesus impact how you think and live throughout your daily life? But it's important to keep in mind what's said in the first two chapters as Paul turns this corner. And we're going to tackle just 17 verses in chapter 3, which really could be three or four sermons, but I say that every week and uh, try to tie it all together at the end. I want to just take these 17 verses in chapter 3 in three segments, three different portions. So if you have your Bibles open to Colossians chapter 3, we'll read just the first four verses of chapter 3. Colossians 3 verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. 
This is a remarkable passage. He says, if then, in the English Standard Version, New International Version says, since then you've been raised with Christ. The New Living Translation says, since you have been raised with Christ. And the New American Standard Bible says, therefore, if you have been raised with Christ. They're saying, because this is true about you, positionally true is who you are, then you must do something about that. What is this thing we must do? I want to say it simply, seeking and setting. That's what we must do, seeking and setting. Paul says, since you've been raised with Christ, seek him and set your minds on him. Let's talk about those things. You have been raised with Christ, so now you must seek him and set your minds on him. What does that really mean? To seek means, the Greek word means to pursue. Zeteo is the Greek word. It means to pursue and actively desire. It's a, it's a present imperative. I mean, you continually seek. Go on seeking. The word to set is the Greek word phroneo. It means to have in mind, to fix on, to focus on, fix or establish. So fix and establish your mind on who Christ is and then actively seek him, continually seek him. This seeking and setting is foundational to when Paul is going to tell us to put off and put on. Because what you're seeking is your identity. You're setting your minds on who Christ is and you're seeking him and you're establishing this is who I am in him. Paul says, since you have been, since you have been raised with him, seek him and set your minds on him. And it's only possible because of what Paul says has happened to us. You have been raised in verse 1. You have died in verse 3. Now, I'll put it this way. What has happened to Jesus has happened to us. Christ has died. Christ has been raised. You have died. You have been raised. Christ will return in glory. You will be raised in glory. What has happened to Jesus has happened to you. That's hard for us to get. Like, we think of it this way. When I talk about my favorite sports teams, the Chicago Bears, the Chicago Cubs, I use the we pronoun. I say, we lost today. We lost again today. We lost again this week, you know. I know that Kurt here would say, we won, because he's a Patriots fan. I get tired of hearing that, right? So I say, whoa, here's what we need to do in the offseason. We need to get a new quarterback. We need a new manager. We need this. And sometimes, if we're honest, I, I have, I'm on my couch with a bowl of popcorn. I have nothing to do. It's not we, but I think of it in terms of we. That's a fictitious we. My union with the Bears is totally imaginary, right? I'm not united in any way. They're not depending on me in any way. I like to think that they are, but they're not. That's not what Paul's talking about here when he says you have been raised. It's not a fictitious, imaginary union. It's a real union. You have died with him. You have been raised with him. You are in him. If that's not true, then all this seeking and setting and putting off and putting on, which we'll talk about in a minute, is impossible. It's just more burden on you to work hard morally, which won't change you. But if it's a real union, if you really are united with him in his death and his resurrection, if that's what we say at baptism, buried with Christ in baptism and risen with him to new life. That's not just biblical language. It's true of those who are in Christ. You've actually died. You've actually been raised. This is what Paul means in Galatians 2.20, which if you're looking for a life verse and you don't have one, you could do a lot worse than Galatians 2, 2 verse 20. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Could it be clearer? It's not my life, it's his life in me, flowing through me. That's the goal. Not my moral effort to measure up to his standard, but his life now coming into my life. So Paul says, because you have been raised with him, here's what you must do. Set your minds on him. Think of it like a recalibration every day. Like recalibrating, realigning, resetting yourself, moment by moment, on who he is and who, who you are in him. Because we get off course, don't we? We need recalibration and realignment. Now, Paul knows that true transformation begins with how you think. That's why he says, seek him and set your minds on him. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul says that we are conformed no longer to the patterns of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our what? Minds. Real life change begins in how you think. A renewed mind. 
Let's read on here what he tells us to do then. Verses 5 through 9. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. We'll stop there. This, three times Paul uses the phrase, put to death, put away, and put off. It's important to know that Paul starts this passage by telling us to put off, and he ends it by saying, you have put off. Put to death these things because you have put off the, new self, the, the, the old self. In other words, he's anchoring it back in our identity, who we are. You have died with Christ, so now you can put to death those things which bring death. Are you tracking? You have died with Christ, and so now you are able in him to put to death those things which bring death into your life. This is putting off. Puritan pastor and theologian John Owen famously said, Be killing your sin or it will be killing you. Jesus doesn't say, get a handle on things, manage your sin, keep it in its place, suppress it. He says what? Kill it. Put it to death. I have a good friend who says that we are either ruthless or reckless when it comes to sin. There's no middle ground. We're either recklessly thinking we can manage it, or we are ruthlessly putting it to death as God commands us to. And we cannot do that unless we are seeking and setting our minds on him and recognizing that we're, we've already died in him. It's his death, his defeat of sin in the grave that enables me to put it to death. If that's not true, then I'm just trying by moral effort to stop doing stuff. Thomas Chalmers, another Puritan pastor, wrote a sermon called The Expulsive Power of a New Affection which is a terrible title, but it's a great sermon. He says, basically, just to rail against all the bad stuff in your life. Stop lying. Stop cheating. Stop being angry. Stop deceiving. Stop beat lusting. Stop, stop, stop it, stop it, stop it. It's bad. That has no power to change your life. You already know you should do that. What does? He says a new affection has the power to change us. So Paul's saying our new affection is seek Christ. Set your mind on Christ. That's the power to put off. And, and the Bible's clear about this, though most of us don't like to think about it. You're either reckless or ruthless when it comes to your sin. Paul gives two descriptive lists here of the kind of sins we're to put off and put to death. First, the sins of the desire, and then second, the sins of discord. We'll talk about them each here. The sins of desire in verses 5 through 6, he lists them. And they're basically in two categories. Uh, Sexual desire out of control, and the desire for possessions and material covetousness out of control. He's saying your desires don't define you. That is a very unpopular message today in our culture. You are not the sum total of your passions and desires. You're much more than that. Put them to death, he says. The, Paul is saying that you can exercise control over your sinful desires. Now, secular psychologists will tell you, not only can you not do that, you should not do that. Because your desires are who you are. That's your identity. And to be your true self, you must give full reign to your desires. But the gospel says, actually, there's stuff in you that you should not give full reign to. It's going to lead to destructiveness in your own life and in others. It's going to lead to death. Friends, the idea that we must look inside to find our true self? You ever look inside and, and, and not like what you see? I don't, want my, I don't want to become myself. I want to become like Christ. There are things in me that are not good, that must be resisted and put down and put to death by his grace. And the same is true for you. The gospel runs con contrary to the primary message we hear in our culture today, which is, you know what? Don't suppress desires. That will, that will only depress you. Give rein to them. That's who you are. The gospel says, actually, no. 
Some of your desires are sinful desires, and they run contrary to your true identity, which is in Christ. And in Him, you identify which is which, and what needs to be put to death, and what needs to be given new life. And the truth is, I don't want to be myself. I want to be like Jesus. So there's sins of desire. There's also sins of discord. This is the second list he gives, and these are relational sins. He lists things that not only kill your soul, but kill community, kill your relationships. Look at the second list in verses 8 and 9. If you have your Bible, it's not on the screen, but I'll just read it for you. You must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. The stuff we say to each other and about each other. Jesus says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. These things bring death to us and to our relationships. Because Jesus has died, we must die to these things. Here's, the, here's the, how I'll sum it up. Victory over sin is possible, but it only comes through your union with Christ. Victory over sin does not come by trying hard to stop doing stuff and to start doing stuff. That just exhausts you morally. Victory over your sin starts with seeking Christ, setting your mind on Christ. And in that identity, in that union, gives us the power to put off the old self. Not purely moral effort. Christian renewal is not a cosmetic cover-up. It's not sin management. It's death and resurrection. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Great Divorce. Anybody read it? The Great Divorce? It's one of his lesser-known books. I think it's outstanding. It's an imaginary bus trip from hell to heaven. Now, Lewis doesn't believe that there's buses from hell to heaven. It's imaginary. It's a supposal. The people that are in hell are called the ghosts. They're shadowy people. And the bright people are the ones in heaven. There's this character in the story, a man who has a red lizard attached to him that uh, symbolizes lust, which controls his life. Lustful desires. And he feels he can't live without this red lizard. And the bright person, the angel of God, says, I must kill it, but you must allow me to kill it. And the man is terrified that if you kill this desire, you kill me. And the angel says, it won't kill you, but you must let me kill it. May I kill it? May I kill it? Yes, over and over again, may I kill it? And finally, in a whimper, the man says, oh, God, have mercy, God, have mercy. Go ahead, do what you must. And he kills it. And the man is transformed. It's, it's only in that that our transformation happens. Most of us think, yeah, I know I'm not perfect, but this area of my life, you know, I just I want to keep it under control. You can't control it. Put it to death, Paul says. Put it away. Strip it off. It doesn't belong on you. You are a child of the king. Why are you wearing the clothes of a beggar? Put it off. Strip it off. Put it to death. I sold all my big clothes. I gave them away. I didn't sell them. Nobody wanted them. But I gave them away. Why? I don't want to go back to that guy. Spiritually speaking, that's what Paul's saying. And in verse 9, he says, Seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, he doesn't just leave us there. Wouldn't it be, it would be tragic if Paul just left us there. Stop doing all this stuff. Put it all off because Christ has died and that was it. Sometimes I think in Christian community, we focus on the stuff we should not be doing. I notice in accountability groups. I've been in men's accountability groups for a number of years, and I love the group that I'm in. Sometimes we focus too much on the things we must stop doing, right? We pray about sins that are controlling us and things we should stop doing. Confession is good. Prayer and accountability about your sinful patterns is good. We need that. But you can also have accountability for things you should be doing, for Christ-like character, to be held accountable to the things we're supposed to put on, and that's where Paul takes us next, verses 10 through 17. In verse, 10, in verse 9, he says, seeing that you have put off your old self with its practices, and verse 10, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I, I, I told, that's, that's five sermons right there. But we're going to cram it in the next ten minutes. Notice again, Paul says that our new self is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Remember what we talked about? Paul understands that life transformation, real transformation, happens here first. How you think about who God is and about who you are. Your new self is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. It begins with how you think and understand yourself. Just as Christ died so you can put off that which brings death, Christ has been raised, and you have been raised with him, so you can put on that which brings life. Put off the things that kill your soul and kill relationships. Put on the things that bring life to you and to those around you. Putting on. This is putting on. Now, Paul's not saying that somehow in verse 11, Jesus has removed all these distinctions. Notice when he said in verse 11 that we're, there's, no, there's no barbarian or Scythian, slave or free, male or female, but Christ is all and in all. What does that mean? Some would have us believe what that means today is that in Jesus, there's no more distinctions at all about ethnic, racial, or gender line. That's not true. Jesus does not eliminate our differences. There's still male and female people in the world. There are still gender and racial differences in the world. And we should celebrate our diversity. These are not bad things. These are good God-given things. What he's saying is those differences are no longer divisions. They don't divide us. They don't keep us apart. There's no hierarchy. There's no place where we're saying you're less than because of this, because of your race or your ethnicity or your gender. And that was happening all the time in the first century, and it happens still today. He's not saying there are differences. He's saying those things should no longer divide us. But Christ is all and in all. In other words, what we have in common in Jesus is far greater than any of the things which would otherwise divide us. The main divisions in the first century, racial, barbarian, Scythian, economic, slave or free, and gender, male or female. What are the ones today? Oh, I don't know, maybe political? Do you feel divided politically? Are you listening to me? You should be going, yes, I do. Yes, we're headed to another election cycle, friends. As Christ followers, what divides us is not the, the right or left political aisle. Right? That's trumped, pun intended, by Christ. By Jesus Christ, who unites us. Set your mind on him. Seek the things that are above. That's your identity. That's who we belong to. Paul's saying those things which divide us then and now, should not be for those that are in Christ. They should not be. Verse 12. This, verse 12 is the key to understanding the whole passage about putting on. If you don't get this, you miss the whole point. Verse 12. Let's, I'm going to read it again. You'll see it with some parts highlighted here on the screen. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. But that first part, that first section of verse 12 is the key. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Three words are crucial to understanding this verse and what it means to put on. Chosen, holy, and beloved. That's who you are, the Bible says. If you place your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, it doesn't mean you're perfect or you have it all together or you agree on every theological point, but you know that he died for you and rose for you and he's your only hope in this life and for eternity. If that's true, then you're what Paul says as being in Christ. You might not feel like you're in him right now. Maybe you have some struggles going on, but you are positionally in him. And if you are in him, you are chosen, holy, and beloved. Do you know who you are? Do you, I mean, this is, if you've, if you've been tuning out till now, tune in, all right? You are chosen, holy, and beloved. Chosen 
Paul is echoing here language from the Old Testament. He's echoing God's language of his people Israel, his collective chosen people. I'm going to read to you from Deuteronomy 6, or 7, excuse me, verses 6 through 7. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number of other people, but because the Lord set his love on you and chose you. It is because the Lord loves you and is keeping his oath to you. Those three words are right there in the Old Testament. Paul draws on them here in Colossians saying, you are chosen, holy, and beloved. Chosen meaning God, it's, Jesus himself says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you for each other and for faith. God's chosen you, picked you. Remember when you were a kid and they picked teams on the playground? Anybody ever picked last or not picked at all? Right? Rest assured, friends, God chose you. He picked you. He loves you. Holy doesn't mean perfect, doesn't mean sinless. In this context, it means set apart. God chose you and set you apart as his. This one is mine. This one is set apart as mine. She's mine. He's mine. And I love her. And I love him. I, my whole life has been about performance. As an athlete, I played football and wrestled all my high school and college years, and it's sort of just ingrained in me that your worth is measured in your success, in what you achieve, what you accomplish. And sometimes I struggle to approach pastoring that way. Achievement, success, more. And God is still, you know, I'm younger than most of you, but older than some of you. <laughs> God is still refining me and reminding me, I chose you. I, I set you apart. I love you. You can't earn that. You can't achieve that. That is what I am doing in you. That's who you are positionally. You can't gain it. You can't lose it. If you're in Christ, that's who you are. So Paul says, Put on then, because you're loved and chosen and holy. If that's not first, then putting on is just try hard to be better. The endless spiritual treadmill, the hamster wheel of eternity, right? Just trying to be good, trying to be good, trying to be good. Do you know who you are? If you don't, then trying to put on will exhaust you. If you do, it's life to you. So if that's true, if you're chosen, holy, and beloved, then what do you do? What's your response to that? What do you, what's your response to being chosen, holy, and beloved of God? Paul says, change clothes. Right? That's his answer. Strip off and put on. Change your clothes, he says. Wear the clothes that are in keeping with your true identity. Stop wearing the rags of your old self. Now, the clothes that Paul tells us to put on, this is not a patchwork of individual virtues. I think we approach this list sometimes like a, like a smorgasbord, like a buffet. I used to love buffets. Now I, I like salad bars. But anyway, <laughs> I don't like them. I just eat them. Anyway, he says, uh, he says, you know, put on then compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another in, lo with one another in love and forgiving each other. We think we could, like, choose. Like, you're going down the, with your tray, right? Oh, compassion, I like some of that. Forgiveness, not for her, thank you. I've had enough of that, right? You know? Meekness, I don't even know what that means. Sounds like weakness, I don't want any of that, right? Humility, I guess just a little bit of humility, just a tiny bit. You know? We think we can do it that way. That's not what he's saying. He's saying put on the character of Christ. It's not patchwork of virtues. It's a seamless garment of the righteousness of Christ, his character. It's, it's all-encompassing. We put on. You know, we'll say this often, uh, that if you want to know what God is like, where should you look? Who should you look to if you want to know what God is like? Jesus. Good answer. It's always the good church answer. Say Jesus, right? He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. But where should you look if you want to know what humanity is supposed to be like? Same answer, friends. Jesus. He's fully God and fully man. If you want to know what God is like, look at Christ. If you want to know what we're supposed to be like, look at Christ. What you're putting on is not a list of, you know, good deeds. It's the character of the one who loved you and gave himself for you. This is what Paul means when he says your life is hidden with Christ in God. 
In other words, the new self you're putting on is the character of Christ, Paul says, who is your life. And did you notice something about all the things he told us to put on? Look at these characteristics again. Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. These are all things that you only know you have if you're in relationship with other people. What is patience if you're the only one there? You see them in relational contexts, right? Paul doesn't say, put on productivity, efficiency, excellence, and competence, right? No. Patience, kindness, compassionate, compassion and humility. Because the you in this passage, we read Colossians 3 with the you as individualistic singular too often. There are personal applications, no doubt. You are a new creation. You are in Christ. But the you is actually y'all. Anybody from Texas here? Alabama, I know, right? Y'all. Paul's not just saying you. He's saying y'all. You all are in Christ. You all must put on compassionate hearts, humility, patience. Christ is our life collectively as much as he is my life and your life personally. And verse 13, I love, even though it humbles me. Verse 13, he says, Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. The Bible's so realistic. It's, it's calling us to a high standard and a new identity, no question about that. But it's also not naive. Why would Paul say bear with each other if we didn't have issues? He tells me to bear with all of you, and you to bear with me, and the person down the road from you, and behind you, and in front of you, and the one who just slept in and didn't come today, right? All of them. Bear with each other. Why? Because we're in process. You have been made new, and you are being made new. You're in process. So even though Paul says, the old is gone, the new has come, we read that a minute ago in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, Paul also knows that the new takes a while for some of us. The new, we keep putting on the old clothes, and so we bear with each other. Why? The key to bearing with each other is to remember what Christ has borne for you. This is what Paul says. For if you have a complaint, if you have a grievance, if you have a grudge, if you're offended, what do you do with that? You bring it to Jesus, the one who loved you and gave himself for you. And you remember what he has borne for you, his patience and compassion for you. And you remember that that person who's irritated me so much, they're in process. They're in process of putting on the new self just like I am. And my job is not to, my job is to put on the new self in forgiveness right now. If, I, if I'm going to be unforgiving, what's that? That's the old ratty coat. Take that off, Paul says. Put on the cloak of forgiveness. Put on, don't put on the old smelly socks of resentment. Right? Put on the new self. And then he says, Love, in verse 14, put over, over all this stuff, over all these put on love, which binds them all together. Love is the summary of all these virtues, which holds everything together. Now, we're almost out of time here, but I want to just make a comment on this last way this passage ends. Paul says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. I don't think he's just talking about corporate worship here. I think he's talking about the way that we interact with each other. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. How often in regular conversation throughout the week does the word of God spill out of your mouth and heart and mind? Do you know why we're asking you to memorize Colossians 1, 15 to 17? Not to make you do religious stuff. Paul, the, the psalmist, David says in Psalm 119, verses 9 through 11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The Bible, the Word of God, is, is a sword of the Spirit, we're told. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. And then as you go about your life, you're singing in your own heart and to each other, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, full of gratitude for all that God has done. Does that characterize your daily life? Not just the one hour a week we get together when we're forced to do it because the words are on the screen, right? Tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, does it characterize your life? I was thinking about this in my own life. You know often what I'm doing? Talking about sports trivia, movie quotes, 
It's fine. But the word of Christ should dwell in us richly, should flow out of our mouths to each other. And then Paul says, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, be thankful. There's a profound connection between the peace of Christ and the word of Christ. The peace of Christ rules in you and in me and in us when the word of Christ dwells in us. And Paul's not primarily talking here about inner peacefulness, sense of inner peace. He's talking about peace in our community. That the peace of Christ rules in how we interact with each other when the word of Christ dwells in us. You want the peace of Christ, friends? How many of you feel like you could use the peace of Christ in your heart? Let the word of Christ dwell. There's no peace of Christ or the word of Christ. There's no just like wistful thinking for remove conflict. Peace, by the way, is not the absence of conflict. It doesn't mean all, all difficulties go away. It means that in the midst of conflict, I can have peace. This is what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. He himself is our peace, who has made two one by destroying the dividing wall of hostility, breaking down the barrier. In Jesus, we've been reconciled to God, peace vertically and peace horizontally. There's no peace of Christ without the word of Christ. I think we hear things like put off the old self, put on the new self, and we feel obligated to try harder to be better. That is not what Paul's saying. He's saying set your minds on him. Seek the things that are above. Because you are chosen of God, wholly set apart by God, beloved of God. And in him, in the death and resurrection of Jesus, in that union, you're enabled to put off those things which bring death and put on those things which bring life. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, it's difficult for us to truly believe, not just with our minds, but with our hearts and our whole beings, that we are united with you in death and in resurrection and life. And that our union is not theoretical or imaginary, it's very real. And it's in this union that you call us to put off and to put on. We praise you for your death and your resurrection. We ask you to remind us this morning and this week and our, every day of our lives that we are united with you. And in that union alone, we have victory over sin and death. Amen.